and good morning. It's a joy to be with you today. It's a little unusual times we find ourselves in. Most of you may feel like you're imprisoned at home, uh, but the Bible says that the Word of God is not bound, and we know that through the wonder of media, many people are watching this morning on their computers or on their television screens, and I believe God is going to use this time to make the church stronger. It's an honor to be here at Kirby Woods Baptist Church on this Lord's Day. Kirby Woods has long been a great church here in Memphis, has a great reputation, and God is going to continue to use her for His glory. If you have your Bibles this morning, I would invite you to Psalm 91. That is our text for today, and I'm going to be reading from the New American Standard Version. This is the Word of the Lord. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for it is He who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His pinions, and under His wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. You will not be afraid of the terror by night or of the arrow that flies by day or of the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. For you have made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High your dwelling place. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. For he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways, and they will bear you up in their hands that you do not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra and the young lion and the serpent you will trample down. Because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With a long life I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. God has placed this text on my heart today because it is a reminder that while the world may find itself in the midst of a global pandemic, God is not surprised. God has not been caught unawares. To that end, God speaks to His own this morning to assure us that He has not abandoned us. He has not forgotten us. He has not left us to some unknown fate. God has a purpose and a plan, and He's calling us this morning to put our trust and our confidence in Him, and He's reminding us that especially when times get bad, He is there for us. It is a place where we can find peace, a peace that passes understanding, where our hearts will rest, and we can put this temporal crisis that our world is facing in proper perspective. Now, the text breaks down in into three particular sections. The first section is found in verses 1 and 2, where we are encouraged and directed to abide in God as our refuge. The second section, verses 3 through 13, speaks to the benefits of trusting in God and making Him our refuge. And then the final section, 14 through 16, is God's response, but it speaks to the relational reality of being in fellowship with God. So I want to look at each of those in, in course. First of all, God is our refuge. Perhaps like me, you've been getting phone calls. A lot of people are bored, and so they're looking through their phone uh, contact list, and they're calling all their friends they haven't talked to in a long time, friends they've been too busy to talk to, and now they have more time than they know what to do with, and they're asking questions like, how long do you think this is going to last? Is this going to ruin our economy? Do you think that we're going to bounce back? I mean, what, what's going to happen? And, and people are asking all kinds of questions because what they're really looking for is they're looking for hope. They're looking for hope. But, you know, if you look at the news, the news is almost all negative, in fact, a simple search on the internet will demonstrate that anywhere from 70 to 90 percent of all media news is negative. And the reason for this is because the media outlets have realized that people respond to negative news much more quickly 
than they do to positive news. In fact, there was a television station in another country that decided for one day they were just going to do nothing but positive news, and their ratings tanked because nobody wanted to hear good news. Everybody wanted to hear bad news. And, and the real temptation during this time is to sit and watch the news and begin to believe all of the things that we're hearing and begin to have questions and doubts and fears. But I think God's Word this morning offers us something that the news doesn't. God's Word offers us hope. Now, hope's a powerful thing, but not all that is offered as hope is real. I mean, there is such a thing as false hope. I was reading in the news just this week that in Iran, some 500 people had died because someone told them that if they drank industrial alcohol, it could protect them from the coronavirus, and they drank it, and nearly 500 of them died. They put their hope in the wrong thing. You see, there is such a thing as hoping and trusting in the wrong thing. That's like when people say, well, I'm a person of faith. Well, that's all well and good. What do, you, what do you put your faith in? Because you see, if you put your faith in the wrong thing, then you're going to be sadly disappointed. That's why when we come to put our trust and our faith in someone or something, we need to make sure that our faith is put in something or someone that is trustworthy, that is faithful. And to that end, the Scripture calls us to put our trust or our faith in God. But of course, in moments like this, we really see where people do put their trust, don't we? I mean, a lot of people have put their trust in the financial portfolio that they've built up over the years. Given the volatility of the stock market over the last several weeks, it would seem to me that they've misplaced their trust. Proverbs 23, 4 and 5 says, Do not weary yourself to gain wealth. Cease from your consideration of it. When you set your eyes on it, it is gone. For wealth certainly makes itself wings like an eagle that flies towards the heavens. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 says, Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all good things to enjoy. So some people have put their trust, their confidence in finances. Others have put their confidence in science. And while we're very grateful, let me just say that, and reaffirm that we're very grateful for modern medicine and all that modern medicine can do for us and the great advances that have been made therein over the last several centuries, surely something like the current virus that we are experiencing should demonstrate the limited nature of science, how limited it really is. You need to remember that until about 120 years ago, most scientists and doctors in the United States did not believe in what we know as the germ theory of disease. In fact, in, into the late 1890s, into the turn of that century, 1900, most of them believed in what was called the miasma theory, which said that, that sickness and disease came from decaying matter, from organic matter that was decaying, and you could always tell if there was a sickness afoot because it smelled bad, and if there was a bad smell, then that's where sickness came from. It wasn't until about 1900 that they started realizing that there were these things called germs. And so if we put our trust in science, we, we, we have to ask ourselves a question, where have we really put our trust? I mean, scientists all over the world, and I'm so grateful for what they're doing and so grateful for the developments that are being made, but they can't figure out how to beat this little virus. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1.27 that God has chosen the simple things to confound the wise, and certainly we are confounded, but God is not confounded. Others put their trust in government. In moments of crisis, they're confident the government's going to save them. And we're all very grateful for our public servants who are working hard to do whatever they can to solve this current crisis and to keep as many Americans safe as they can. We need to remember that governments are made up of fallen, finite human people just like you and me. And the Bible is replete with warnings not to put our trust in men. Psalm 146, 3 and 4 says, Put not your trust in princes and the Son of Man, in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Jeremiah 17, 5, Cursed is the one who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. And there's nothing wrong with looking to science and, 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 and looking to our government for help, but that's not where our ultimate trust ought to lie. Others 
like the preppers. I saw a thing online the other day that said, to all preppers, we apologize, you were right. You know, <laughs> they've got all, all the food and all the toilet paper that they're going to need for 30 years. But they somehow think that their preparation is going to keep them and, and protect them. And the reality is, if you are simply trusting in your own preparedness, that you've prepared for all of this, you're going to be sadly mistaken. The Bible says the one who trusts in himself is a fool in Proverbs 28, 26. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand me. I want to reiterate this. We, we look to modern science for what it can do, and we're grateful for the wisdom and knowledge that God has given those who work in that field. So grateful for that. Many working within our government, working diligently to try and solve this to whatever degree they can. We're so very grateful for that. But at the same time, what God is telling us in this text is that while these things that we confront may perplex us, God is not perplexed. The text calls us to put our trust in God. It calls us to make Him our refuge. As you may recall, one of the ways that Scripture emphasizes things is through repetition. And it's interesting to note that in Psalm 91, this word refuge is used three times. In fact, it's the only psalm in the entire book of Psalms that repeats this word three times. And so there's an emphasis on the reality that God is calling us to make Him our refuge, to put our trust and our confidence in Him. Now, that word refuge means to take shelter or to trust. It's interesting in Jeremiah 17, 17, and in Joel 3, 16, that same Hebrew word is translated hope. Isn't that interesting? Because when we put our trust in the right place, it gives us hope. It gives us confidence. It gives us the assurance that somebody has got this under control. It speaks of God as a shelter. It's real interesting how this passage uses a variety of metaphors to illustrate hope and the trust that is ours when we put our faith in God. It talks about God as a shelter, a shadow that will protect us from the sun, a fortress where we'll be safe from onslaughts, a dwelling place where we can find rest, wings where we are sheltered from harm, a shield that will pr protect us from external attacks. And all of these words paint a word picture that, that say God is going to protect us. He's going to care for us. He is going to be our refuge. And what's more, not only are we told that God and God alone is our refuge, verse 1 tells us that we are to dwell or to live in that space. The idea of dwelling or abiding is a powerful metaphor for living. We're not merely to run to God in times of trouble. Some people do, don't they? Some people have what we call foxhole religion. They get in a very difficult circumstance in life and they turn to God. But those who have their faith in God constantly and they live in that space and they live in that place and they abide and they dwell in that reality where God is walking with them. As the old song says, he, he walks with me and talks with me and tells me that I am his own. Those of us who walk in that kind of relationship with God, we are not shattered. We are not scattered. We are not dismayed when things come along. And we don't have to just run to him. We are already walking in fellowship with him. And that's the picture that this particular passage says. We are to deliberately, continuously put our faith in God to dwell in that state of perpetual trust. We're to join with David who in Psalm 20 says, Now I know the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with st strength, with saving strength of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. Church this morning, I'm here to tell you that God is someone who is trustworthy. God is someone in whom we can put our faith. God is someone when we put our faith and our confidence and our trust in him, we are never going going to be disappointed. Remember, before anything else, before anything else, God's Word is a revelation of Himself to His people. Here's what God's doing. In this text, He's revealing to us that He is a God who has got this covered. He's got this under control. And people will say, well, why would God let this happen? Folks, that's a bigger question than we can answer because that's the problem of sin. When sin came into the world, death came into the world. And what we're experiencing and the reason there's any kind of death, the reason there's any kind of disease is because man rebelled against God. 
But our text this morning is telling us that even though there's death and even though there's sin and even though there, there's, there is disease and even though there are things that we are going to encounter that we were not expecting, God is there for us. He's not caught unawares. He is trustworthy. Jesus himself in the Sermon on the Mount says, don't worry about what you're going to eat tomorrow. Don't worry about what kind of clothes you're going to... Listen, the the Gentiles worry about these things, but your Father knows what you need before you ask. He clothes the grass of the field. He cares for the birds of the air. Will He not also care for you? The call this morning, first and foremost, is to make God our refuge, to put our confidence and our trust in Him. We are grateful for all the other things He gives us, but at the end of the day, we have to put our confidence and our faith in God. There's a second thing I want you to see, and that's the benefits of trusting in God and seeking Him as our refuge. As we read the benefits of making God our refuge, we need to remember an important rule in biblical interpretation which says that each verse is interpreted in the light of every verse. You see, if we're not careful, we can take one verse out, we call that proof texting, and we can take it out and make it say whatever we want it to say, and that is particularly uh, true with this particular passage, and here's why. You remember over in Matthew chapter 4 when Jesus is in the wilderness as he's being tempted by Satan. And what does Satan do? The Bible says very clearly, the devil took him upon the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you on their hands, they shall bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. What does Satan do? Satan quotes Psalm 91 to Jesus. Imagine that. Imagine the devil taking the Scripture and using it against the one who wrote the Scripture. But you know what he does? He takes it out of context because Jesus comes back and puts it in context. And Jesus says, on the other hand, it's written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So every verse needs to be interpreted in light of every other verse. So the promises of this text are real. The promises of this text are very amazing. It says that God will deliver us from the snare of the trapper, from deadly pestilence. He will cover us so that we can find refuge. He promises that we don't have to fear the terror of night. We don't have to fear the arrow that flies by day or the unseen pestilence that moves in the darkness. A thousand can fall at our side, 10,000 at our right hand, but it's not going to approach us because we've made the Lord our refuge. No evil will befall us. These are powerful words of promise. But how do we contextualize them? Because you say, Pastor, there are Christians Christians who are dying from the coronavirus. I mean, how can you say that God is going to keep it from your tent and there are Christians that are dying? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Taking all this into account, here's what I believe the text is saying. I believe the text is reminding us that God is sovereign in all things, especially in the lives of the people. And one of the clear messages of this psalm is that nothing is going to befall his people that he has not either allowed or preordained. That is to say, our times, our lives, our very breath is in the hands of God, and he has got it under control, and he has our back. David knew this. In Psalm 31, 15, he said, my times are in your hands. Only when we understand and accept that God is sovereign in all things, especially in our lives, we'll be able to see the reality that is from God's eternal perspective. If we're not careful, we can look at the world around us and we can get caught up in the very same kind of fear and trembling and despair and dismay that lost people are are, are involved in. And and we can begin to believe all the pundits that say the, the world's coming to an end. But folks, listen to me. God is on his throne this morning. He is not. He is not weakened by this. In fact, God is going to demonstrate through this that he is faithful and we can trust him. God has it under control. I believe this text is calling us to humbly surrender ourselves to the Father's faithful care. It's telling us that storms will come. And when they do, we have a place to hide. We have a refuge. And that place is God. He's calling us to put our trust and our hope in Him. And when we do, in His time and in His way, He will save us. Psalm 34, 19 says, Many of the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of, out of them all. Well, you say, well, what about those Christians that die? Well, it all depends on your definition and understanding of what deliverance is. It brings me back to perspective. You see, 
How you envision God's deliverance, what it looks like, will determine your outlook. If, like the lost person, all of your hope is focused on this life and the things you can acquire in this life, then folks, you're going to be disappointed. God never promised his people wouldn't suffer. God never promised that. Instead, he prophets promised that when we suffer, he would sustain us, he would be with us, he would give us hope in the midst of crisis. He never promised Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego they wouldn't walk in the fire. He just promised that he would be with them, and some of us are going to have to walk through this fire, but he's going to be with us every step of the way. Amen. He's promised, folks, he's promised there's more than this life. Aren't you glad there's more than this life? He's promised that there is a life to come, and the life that we now live, we live in anticipation of the life that we're going to live in eternity in heaven with him. Oh my goodness, if we as Christians put our hope just in this world, then all we have is a set of moral uh, 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 rules and regulations. But if we have a living hope that is in Jesus Christ, a faith in the risen Savior, then death itself cannot f make us fearful. Because our Lord will call our name. The dead in Christ shall rise, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air, and we'll be with the Lord forever. I mean, what a wonderful hope we have. I'm reminded of the incident recorded for us in 2 Kings chapter 6. You know the story where the king of Aram has surrounded the city of Dothan. That's not in Alabama, folks. That was in Israel. And... In verse 15, the scripture says, Now the attendant of the man of God had risen and gone out, and behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city, and his servants said to them, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he, the man of God, answered, Do not fear. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. If we could just see God's hand this morning, if he would open our spiritual eyes, and we could see the host of angels that he has surrounding us, and the, the spiritual realm wherein he has made provision for us. How would our fear be dissipated? How would our faith be strengthened this morning? That's what the promises of this are, that God has it, and we are to reap the benefits of putting our trust in him. But how do we do that? Well, how can we have this kind of spiritual sight, this faith that transcends our present circumstances? How can we access this peace that comes from knowing that we're being held in his hands and even death itself cannot separate us from his love? How, how, do, we, how do we have that? Well, the Scripture tells us. In the last two verses here, God answers. I love it when when the Scripture speaks, listen to what he says. Because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him with a long life. I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. These, these words are rich with God's promises to his people. But I want you to note the relational nature of these promises he says in verse 14 that those who love him and know him, who know his name, will be delivered. Verse 15 promises that those who call upon him will receive an answer and will realize his presence and hear his voice, and they will be rescued and honored. Verse 16 sums it up, promising that they will be satisfied with a full life or length of days. They will see his salvation. These promises of peace and refuge are given to those folks who are in relationship with him. And so, you shouldn't be surprised when lost people say, well, where is God? Well, God is there. The problem is not with God. The problem is with us. God has never left us. He's always been there. The problem is whether or not we have come to Him and we've given ourselves to Him. This word know is a very interesting word. It speaks of intimate relationship. This word love speaks of devotion or emotional attachment. So how do we take this text and put it into our application in our lives? Well, let me suggest two ways that we can directly apply this to our lives. First of all, there's an application for those of us who know Jesus Christ. I believe this text speaks to believers, calling believers to make a conscious decision to abide in Christ and dwell in that place of trust. Listen, God knows that we have feet of clay. 
He knows the Bible says that we are but dust, and as a father pities his children, so our father pities us. He knows that we are want to give in to the temptation to fear and to despair. He knows that. And so he gives us his word to call us back to a place of trust, to call us back and give us the confidence that he is there. For Christians, this text is a call to stop listening to the distracting voices around us and to hear what God has to say to us today. He will protect. He will provide. He's got our backs. We are to be wise. We are to be thoughtful. But at the end of the day, we are to put our trust in him and him alone. As the old hymn says, abide with me, fast falls the eventide, the darkness deepen, Lord, with me abide when other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless, oh, abide with me. But when you do this, when you put your confidence in God as a believer, let me, let me suggest two things that will happen in your life. First of all, your faith will give you hope and peace. Your faith in God, when you exercise that faith, when you begin to say, I'm going to put my trust in God, I'm not going to believe all the things I hear that are discouraging and negative, I know that God has this. And you know, there was an article this last week in the New York Times that said, evangelicals are responsible for this because of our disdain for science. And let me just set the record straight, New York Times, we do not disdain science. We are grateful to God for all the advances in science. And Sir Isaac Newton was one of the great Christian writers. In fact, he wrote as much about theology as he did about science. So that's a false dichotomy that they're, they're painting. We, we're not saying that science isn't good. We're saying that God is the creator of the universe, that God is the great physician, that God is the one who reveals to scientists what they know. God is the one where we need to put our trust. When we put our trust in him, we will have a faith and a peace. The Bible talks about a peace that passes understanding. Listen to what Jesus says in John 14. He says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives to you do I give. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. What kind of peace did Jesus have? Well, I want to tell you. Jesus had the kind of peace that when he was in the midst of the storm, he could sleep while the disciples were worried about their life. Jesus said, I'm going to give you that kind of peace. I'm going to give you the kind of peace that you can rest like a baby in the midst of the most challenging circumstances because I have a Father in heaven who's looking out for me. So first of all, when you as a Christian, when you put your faith, your trust in Jesus, here's what happens. When you decide that he's going to be your refuge, you're going to have a peace and you're going to have a sense of, of confidence and a hope that is going to transcend understanding. But there's a second thing that's going to happen. And here's the, here's the cool thing. It's going to give witness to others that there is hope and confidence to be found in Jesus. You know, every other tragedy, I remember I was pastoring when the towers were attacked of 9-11. And the following Sunday, the churches were filled with people. And of course, at this point, they can't be because it's the very nature of the crisis that we're facing. But I'm wondering if something's changed in our culture to where in a time of desperate need, in a time of uncertainty, people are not looking to God anymore. We as Christians ought to be pointing people to Jesus Christ. We ought to be saying, listen, there's more than this life. We ought to be saying, I have found a place where you can rest. I, can, I have found a place where you can put your confidence and your hope. I can tell you how to do that. I'm reminded of the old hymn that says, there is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God, a place where sin cannot molest near to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, blessed Redeemer, send from the heart of God. Hold us who wait before you near to the heart of God. What we ought to be doing, Christians, right now is we ought to be telling people via Facebook, via FaceTime, <laughs> via whatever electronic social distance media we can, we ought to be telling them about Jesus. We ought to be demonstrating that we have a confidence and a faith in Jesus. We ought to be using this tragedy as an opportunity to share the best news that ever was heard, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And of course, that brings me to my final observation, and that is for those who may be watching this morning who do not know Jesus. You 
may have been invited to watch this. You may have stumbled across it as you were looking for something to watch this morning. You may be watching this morning and you don't have a hope and you don't have a confidence. The Bible tells us that Jesus is our hope. But the Bible says that you can't know that peace, you can't know that hope unless you know Jesus. Because, you see, a lot of people know about Jesus. They know Christians they know people who know Jesus. They, 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 they may have gone to church. They may have grown up with people who knew Jesus, but they've never come to know him personally. If I'm walking down the street and I see President Trump across the street, I know who he is, but he doesn't know who I am. And I may feel like I know him, but it doesn't matter if I know who he is if he doesn't know who I am. You see, a lot of people know who Jesus is, but they've never come into personal relationship with him. And so they can't know that peace. They can't know that confidence. They can't have that hope. But if you're watching this morning and you would say with me, you'd say, you know, Pastor, I, I don't know if I would go to heaven when I died. I don't know where I would spend eternity. This thing's got me rattled. What if I died? What if I caught this thing and, and, and it killed me? Where would I spend eternity? How can I have the confidence and the peace and the assurance that, that God has got me in his hands? Well, I'm glad you ask. It's just as simple. But the Bible says if we confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, we can be saved. For whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You're watching this morning and you say, I want that confidence. I want that peace. I want that hope. It's very simple. This morning, if you'll ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, if you'll tell him, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. It's a simple prayer. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. And I, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I give my life. I surrender my life to you. If you'll pray that prayer this morning, Jesus will come into your life. The Bible says, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. He will change you. He will give you a different perspective. He will give you a brand new home. Someday he'll give you a brand new name. If you are at home and you've prayed that prayer this morning, you're going to need a place, a church, where you can be Discipled, where you can grow in an understanding of what it means to be a Christian, what it means to walk in fellowship with God. And I can think of no better church than this church, Kirby Woods Baptist Church. On your screen, you'll find a place where you can click and you can fill out a form. If you've made a decision for Christ this morning, would you do this? Would you click that and fill that out? And someone from our church, someone who loves you, someone who'll be praying for you, will contact you and share with you more about what it means to follow Jesus Christ. Pray with me this morning. Father, during this time of decision, as people pray, as Christians pray prayers of rededication and prayers of strength and hope and prayers, Lord, of recommitment, and as others pray this morning to give their heart and their life to you, my prayer is that you would receive the glory. You would work in individual lives, in homes, in families. And that you would accomplish all this to your glory. And we ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.